On January 17th, USA Darfarsi tweeted the following to the Iranian people. By getting close to the 40th anniversary of the 1979 revolution in Iran, and in line with having direct correspondence with the Iranian people, Secretary Pompeo will respond to your questions in social media pages of USA Darfarsi. Ask your questions and talk about your hopes and wishes for the future of Iran under this post. Hashtag 40 years. The response was immediate and resoundingly restart. Restart is the only opposition to the Islamic Republic that has been heavily censored on social media. And this clear response to Secretary Pompeo did not go unnoticed. Instagram and Twitter began locking the accounts of Restart. And in an article posted on the 20th, opposition group, the MEK, claimed that in response to Secretary Pompeo's question, the Islamic Republic responded by using their forces both inside and outside of Iran to quickly organize a campaign of misinformation against the MEK and the Iranian resistance. They went on to say, by midnight, thousands of anti-MEK and Iranian resistance tweets had been posted on Twitter using a number of hashtags, primarily variations of hashtag restart. The tweets were produced by the regime's troll factories in Mashhad, Tabriz, Yazd, and Tehran. The MEK claims that the Restart Movement is an Islamic intelligence operation. Even though the Ministry of Information recently dispatched a memo to all government security agencies ordering them to silence the Restart Movement and its leader. The MEK has much more in common with the Islamic Republic than Restart. The MEK fought side by side with the Mullahs in the revolution. They took Americans hostage. They killed tens of thousands of Iranians in the Iran-Iraq war. And they merely proposed their own cultish version of Islamic rule. Like the Islamic Republic, individual freedom is not on the table. And this might be why the MEK and the Islamic Republic are threatened by Restart. Restart is a movement that wants an elected representative government, separation of church and state, and the right to bear arms. Restart wants to take the power away from the government and give it to the people. In an age of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. For Infowars.com, this is Greg Reese. That was a report by Greg Reese, who sits in studio with me here. This is the second hour of the David Knight Show. Harrison Smith sitting in for David Knight on this, the 28th of January, 2019. So, you know, we know that right now there's a, I mean, people that are paying attention to the international goings on are holding their breath over what is happening in Iran and Syria and the entire Middle East. We're on sort of the, the, the point of, of a you know, flash going off and the entire world getting pulled into this, uh, this conflict. What are you seeing happen right now? What are the latest uh, developments in this conflict, Greg Reese? Well, the latest thing I'm seeing is, um, aside from that, so the video covered how uh, they're now getting the same sort of uh, game that America's getting as far as Russian bots, you know, their mm. their their restart isn't real. You know, same thing. Trump supporters aren't real. Uh, you're being fooled. These are all just bots and stuff like that. Uh, and then from that, when I started reading the comments, I started reading uh, hashtag invite restart leader to Warsaw, um, Warsaw meeting, Warsaw Pact, and I didn't really know what that was. So I started looking into it, and apparently, uh, the United States has a a planned meeting in, I believe, February, the middle of February, around the 15th, in Warsaw to discuss Iran. Uh, and that's very vague, and no one really knows what's going on. And, and they're getting criticized uh, by the mainstream media all over the world for just uh, bullying Iran and focusing on Iran. Mm. And uh, now there's, you can, I read something in The Guardian that's talking about uh, U.S. backtracks on the Poland and the Warsaw meeting. 
Iran meeting. So that that alone is interesting. And then how uh, the U.S. State Department has been opening up a conversation with the people of Iran. And the thought of, okay, invite our leader to this meeting about Iran and how, I mean, that's all, that, 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 it's like a science fiction movie to me. You know I mean? Mm. It's like, a, you know, a leader of a movement of people coming in an open table to say, well, this is what we want. Right. You know, I mean, it's, um, you, you start getting your hopes up in this time for this great awakening, which we were talking about the last time I was on. And then you see stuff like that and you start realizing it. I guess we can have whatever we, we can, as big as we can dream it, I guess we can have it, but it really is going to be up to all of us. But it does seem like there are many of us now all over the world that are just sort of embracing the idea of truth and re and reason. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, it's taken root all over. Uh, and you were mentioning to me a little while ago about the reach out that uh, the State Department is doing to the people of Iran. Uh, so you talk, can you talk a little bit about that? I think you said Pompeo tweeted out basically saying, people of Iran, what type of government do you want? And got a, a ton of responses on social media, on Twitter. And how, how's that going? Well, that uh, that's also interesting because that is a new thing. I, I looked into that doing the story more, and U.S. Dar Farsi, I couldn't figure out exactly what the D-A-R is. I'm sure it, it makes sense somewhere. But uh, USA Dar, Dar Farsi is a social media I don't believe it's just Twitter. It's a social media uh, channel, uh, cross platforms, I believe, that was made by the State Department to communicate directly with the people of Iran, mm. which that alone I think is interesting. I mean, I haven't been following global politics for long, but that seems kind of fresh and unique to me as far as uh, current events and everything. So, uh, and then I caught them a few months ago. Uh, they actually mentioned through USA Dar Farsi that. The USA does not, they were answering questions. And one of the questions was, why does the United States not support Reza Pahlavi? Mm. So obviously a loaded question. They're, it's assuming the answer already. Because I've never heard the United States come out and say we're not supporting Reza Pahlavi. Right. And the answer, and that was the question that was chosen to be answered. As far as I could see, it was one of the very few questions I, I've seen that was chosen to be answered. And the answer was, uh, bec the, because the United States supports the people of Iran to have their own representative government. Uh, and because the people of Iran have not had a populist movement in over 170 years or something. So basically right there, it's saying the people of Iran deserve to be under out from under the thumb of England and Russia and right. anyone else who's been choosing to stomp on their foot on their neck for yeah. the past 170 years. So that's very interesting. And then that was followed up by, uh, the Pompeo coming right out and saying, what are your dreams for the future of Iran? What do you want to see your, your country be? Which is, you know, it, what it reminded me of is back when I was still a bit hopeful <laughs> after 9-11, um, the uh, regime change. Obviously, it smelled, it smelled bad all, all from the beginning, but it was out of 9-11. I still had some anger in me and... I, so I was still, I would, uh, I'm making excuses for myself, but, but basically I remember seeing that as something that could be potentially quite beautiful, like helping people get what they want instead of having to always have a violent revolution. Maybe it always will take a violent revolution, but that's the other interesting thing about restart is they don't believe that they believe they can have their government just through knowledge, through mm. waking people up, enlightening people. Uh, removing the veil of ignorance, and they believe that just by doing that, everyone will come to the same reasonable conclusion. And I think it's a sound argument. Um, who knows? If they're not uh, stifled and stopped from doing it. Anyway, Greg Reese joins me on The David Knight Show. We'll be back on the other side to talk a little bit more about Iran and the way that uh, it's playing out regionally and then uh, on the world stage you know, zoomed out a little bit farther. I'll also be giving out the number for you to call in uh, in the second half of this hour. Don't go anywhere, folks. Daryl Hamamoto joins me in the third hour. More breaking news to get to later today. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Greg Reese uh, sits in the studio with me Something here on the David Knight Show. Harrison Smith hosting for you. We're talking about uh, the Middle East, what's going on there, uh, specifically Iran, as well as Israel. Uh, now, we have a little saying here at InfoWars, tomorrow's news today. And man, <laughs> you have no idea 
how very true that is. I, it's like impossible to keep a list of the things we have predicted or said that have then later come true. And one of these main ones was actually from a caller of ours, Pastor Sam, who is a frequent guest and wealth of information, especially about Central South America. And he told us that we were less than a week away from a coup in Venezuela and possible uh, American intervention there. Then sure enough, it comes to fruition. That's why, that's one of the reasons why I'm now opening the phone lines because we get so much valuable information from people who call in. If you have information, comments about anything that we're talking about today or any other news story we might be missing, the number is 1-888-201-2244. That's 1-888-201-2244. Lines are now open and are filling up already, and we will get to those in the next segment. But I want to talk about this story from Bloomberg that, uh uh-oh, you can't find anymore. Weird thing happened to me this morning. I opened it from a bookmark. I hit print and a different story printed out. I thought, that's kind of weird, and I went to a different browser, tried to open it there. Nothing there. I ended up having to screenshot and actually print from my cached version of this article because now if you go to that same uh, uh, URL, instead you get a, uh, instead of getting the article that you wanted, which is Israel demands for U.S. base are a hitch in Trump's plan in Syria, you get another one that says Assad is close to victory, but new conflicts are bubbling up in Syria. First, I just thought it was a headline change, and I started looking more into it. No, the entire story is different. And here's the deal. The American base at El Tamp, originally established as a southern foothold against the Islamic State and a training ground for Syrian rebels, has become one of the main obstacles to the president's plan to leave. Israeli and some U.S. officials argue that a continued American presence there is critical to interrupting Iran's supply uh, supply lines into Lebanon, where Hezbollah, Iran's proxy and Israel, uh, Israel's enemy, has been building up an arsenal. So there's the first, I told you so. I, I'd love to grab the clip from last week's show, I believe on Thursday, where I said that A, this is all about Lebanon, because Israel tried to invade Lebanon in 2016, and was, or, I'm sorry, t- uh, 2006, and was beaten back by Hezbollah thanks to uh, missiles created in Syria. So then they had to go into Syria to try to stop people f- to supporting the militia in Lebanon, and I said that it was to prevent the block of countries and of uh, sympathetic groups joining from, what did I say, Iraq to, uh, or or rather Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon. That's exactly what they say in this article, as I just read. Then it continues to say, U.S. troops at the base established a 55-kilometer deconfliction zone where Uh, including part of the strategic Damascus to Baghdad highway. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about that block. I also mentioned last week that there was a single base that they did not want leaving Syria. This is what they're talking about. This is why InfoWars is tomorrow's news today. Says the surrounding territory is controlled by forces loyal loyal to Syrian President Bashir al-Assad, who's backed by Iran and Russia. And the point is, as this article says, the debate over what to do with al-Tanf reveals U.S. goals in Syria go beyond the official rationale of defeating the Islamic State, which complicates Trump's desire to exit. Does it? I don't think it does. I think it reveals the real intention behind the excuses given as to why we need to be in the Middle East. Uh, The administration also wants to constrain Iran's influence, including by limiting its ability to use Syria as a launching point for operations against Israel. So there you have it. It has nothing to do with us being in uh, the Middle East about ISIS, except for the fact, and I was talking about uh, this with Greg before the break, that our base where we're training Syrian rebels just happens to be in the area where ISIS continually bubbles up from. So clearly the entire uh, reason for us being in Syria has to do with Hezbollah, Iran protecting Israel, and uh, basically that's why you see all of this talk about Iran, as we've seen for years, uh, they've been talking. They've been making little uh, committees to talk about Iran intervention. They've been drumming this up. They basically just come out and say, "Let's bomb Iran." It's been this way since basically 2001. What is happening now, Greg? That either gives you hope or makes you think that it's a lost cause, trying to resolve the conflict that we're seeing without violence. How 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 do you think it plays out without violence? Uh, uh, happening? How do we end it? Or do you, do, do you see violence as inevitable in this conflict? Um, I think, realistically, I think, I think 
violence is to some degree is going to be inevitable. Um, however, I like to consider myself very open-minded and, uh, the majority of the people that I've been contacting in restart insist that it can be done, uh, nonviolently. Um, and, and, and restart sort of at the forefront of this saying we want a revolution, but we want it to be nonviolence. We want it to be one of information and knowledge. changing of minds. Yes. Right. And yeah, so yeah. they're trying to get on the table at this Warsaw meeting, which we need to do a little bit more yeah. research into, but you're talking about how. You know, this is it, it. It almost seems like the type of summit that you have after a war. Right. Weirdly, it seems like this is happening before a war. They're coming together and trying to decide what's best for this country. Yeah. When I first saw it, I was like, um, you know, I'm, I'm very skeptical and, and suspicious minded. When I first saw invite restart leader to Warsaw, my mind said, yeah, that's never going to happen. Um, but then I that was followed up with, well, look at all these other things that have been happening that, you know, mm. and it reminded me where I'm at. Lately, I'm in a very humble place for the past two years. I'm seeing things happen um, on the on the big stage that I kind of resigned myself to being impossible almost, you know. Right. Um, so I feel about Trump. I mean, that, 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 seems, exactly. that seems to be the, the common theme going yeah. on in the world right now is people who've given up hope are finding that just a little bit of resistance can be really valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I've never seen what I've seen with Trump. I've never seen a president do what he said he was going to do. And actually, I mean, everyone says he's going. they're going to kind of do— I mean, Nancy Pelosi was saying she was going to clean the swamp up, you know? So all the— <laughs> Uh, so that the swamp and, monster yeah. emerged from the muck to say they're going to clean the, the swamp up. It's yeah. Ridiculous. And I've said this to restart. I've to some of my closer friends, I've re I've uh, expressed my doubt uh, and my cynicism and skepticism to their, uh, you know, I've even said, you're going to have to you have a plan B <laughs> you right. know? Uh, because I think what they want is important. And, and they and they remind me they're 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 very spiritual about it. They believe that this has happened in the past. Uh, in, uh, before recorded history, um, they all came to this through knowledge. Like their leader is, is credited for giving, he's like Alex Jones. He put out several, several videos and they're very well educated with global politics. Um, I'd say at, like our audience, they remind me, they're like an InfoWars audience. And, uh, and they just, they believe that through spreading that knowledge, and if you look at it, a lot of it does make sense because if you look at the spread of radical Islam, it's through uh, it's through knowledge, it's mm. through a bad knowledge, I would say, and uh, and a limited knowledge, and more of it, more of it is a, uh, of their leaders have a knowledge of the way the mind works, and they're using that to exploit the mind and control mm. the mind. If you can teach a person how the mind works, then that person can protect themselves from delusions and lies. Yeah, and ideally. hopefully, I mean that that's that's it. that's. It's the point of words, right? It's the point of, of, of all this free speech is we'd rather resolve all of these conflicts that we're talking about peacefully. And, and really, the only thing that's stopping us from doing that is the disconnect between people in Iran and people in America. Not a natural dis, uh, a disconnect, but one enforced by our leaders. If we can just connect person on person, everything would be fine, I think.